Hey! Hello and welcome to Rootstock. This is the second live stream of the day. We've just had lunch and I'm full of cake, which is brilliant. Uh, just in case you've just joined us. Hello, my name is Russell Arnott. I am one of the project managers for the Gatsby Plant Science Education Program. It's my job to help people just like plants better. <laughs> that is basically my job. Who are you? Uh, my name is Alex Jenkin and I'm another project manager for the Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme and I run the school side of the programme so um, anyone there who's watching from a school or as a teacher then uh, great to have you with us. You're Thank awesome. you very much. Awesome human beings clearly. There we go. So the theme of this lime stream, lime stream. Ooh, Ooh. Lime is a plant. Lime is a plant. So it's allowed. We're allowed to say lime stream. The theme <laughs> of this live stream is the possibilities of plants. So we're going to look at all the amazing things that plants can do for us and uh, help us out of sticky situations like little things, just little things like feeding the world or climate just change. Little just like just these tiny little things that we might need to deal with in the non too distant future. So uh, we've got five amazing videos that have been made by uh, teams of biology undergraduates from across the um, universities across the whole of the UK. We're going to be showcasing some of those videos today. We're going to be talking to awesome plant science researchers and the students themselves and just basically trying to show off all the amazing things that plants can do. Is that about it? Is that when you say anything else? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, if you've got any questions, please pop them in the, the chat on the YouTube channel. We'll pick them up. Um, we can bring them up on the screen or, or just some comments if you're really enjoying a particular video, pop those up yeah. as well. Um, and we'll try and answer those as we go through. We're going to have some guests joining us here in our lecture theatre studio. Uh, so, um, yeah, hopefully um, we're in for a good afternoon. That sounds awesome. So we're going to kick things off with an amazing video all about sunflowers and in particular the superpowers of sunflowers. Take a look at this sunflower. What do you notice about it? It's got bold, bright yellow petals. It's growing very tall. It might make you think of summertime with its long days and warm weather. You might have seen them growing in a garden or wrapped up in cellophane in a flower shop in August. You may have even seen the sunflower logo on the green lanyard during the global pandemic. Many people thought it was only used to show that they were exempt from wearing a face mask. But it is in fact a universal symbol to let others know that someone may need a bit more support and time in public spaces. The sunflower symbol represents hidden disabilities, which you can't see just by looking at someone. Something else that you may not be able to see are hidden superpowers. Let's take a closer look at that sunflower again. What can you see in the centre of the sunflower? If we get a bit closer, you can see some speckles. Seeds. These are a great tasty snack that are beneficial for your health. These super seeds are good for your immune system as they contain vitamins and minerals like vitamin E. They also have another superpower too. Once crushed, they can be made into sunflower oil. Sunflower oil can be used in cooking as a healthier alternative. This super oil contains lots of unsaturated fats. These are good for your heart health as they lower bad cholesterol levels in your blood. We can use plants and plant products in our cookings to improve our diets and health. Food is an important fuel source and we know that sunflowers can fuel our bodies. But did you know they can also fuel our cars? This is another of their hidden superpowers, making green biofuel. Biofuel is unique because unlike petrol, it is not made from fossil fuels. It is made from living matter, such as food waste and animal and plant waste. Because of the sunflower seeds high oil content, sunflowers make an ideal biofuel crop. Climate change is an ever increasing problem and we need to reduce burning fossil fuels to help save the planet. Sunflowers can be replanted as a renewable fuel source and even absorb waste carbon dioxide gas via photosynthesis. As well as being a super fuel crop, sunflowers can provide super support for other crops as well. A traditional planting method called the Three Sisters plants three crops close together to help each other out. 
These companion plants provide structure, shade and enrich the soil for each other. Since sunflower stems are very sturdy and tall, they provide great support for creeping plants such as beans and tomatoes. Once the sunflowers have finished flowering, their stems can be recycled to create garden trellises and furniture. Sunflowers are just one type of plant with hidden superpowers. Now that's got me thinking, what else can plants do? Think of all the other hidden superpowers waiting to be discovered. We need more plant scientists. We need more plant superheroes just like you. Fantastic, really love that video. I mean, I feel like sunflowers are such an iconic plant. They are absolutely brilliant. I mean, who doesn't like a sunflower? Fields of sunflowers, they're pretty snazzy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously I like the color yellow. So um, there we go. yeah, really working for so me. In many ways you are a sunflower up here on stage with me. Thanks, anyway, thanks Russell. <laughs> um, on that note, we'll switch over to our other sunflower on stage. We're joined by the wonderful Dan Jenkins. Hello. on our sofa over here. So, uh, who are you? So, I'm the head of the Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme, which is the project that funds this rootstock initiative that we're doing at the moment. And it's a project funded by the Gatsby Charitable Foundation to try and promote plant science in schools and with young people. So, hopefully, you out there all getting engaged with this um, plant science stuff today. Fantastic. So, because you, you actually have a background in, in botany, is this correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm curious. Um, so sunflowers have they popped up on your on your radar? Are they do they feature highly? Well, <laughs> I I remember the Blue Peter Grow Your Tallest Sunflower competition. I don't think Blue Peter do that anymore. I wish they did because I remember trying to get the tallest sunflower uh, that I could. Uh, so yes, certainly as long as I can remember, I've seen sunflowers. <laughs> So, just out of curiosity, how tall was your sunflower? I was about three metres, which was, as a, as a six-year-old, was quite tall. That's, uh, that's tall for me as, a, as, a, as an adult. Three <laughs> metres is, is, is a big sunflower. There we go. Um, so, I thought it was really interesting uh, what um, Isabel touched on on her video about sunflower also being like a symbol of, a, of hidden disabilities. Yeah. And I think this is, uh, you know, one of the things that, potentially we struggle with in society is to be we're very accepting of people who who whose disabilities may be a bit more aware but I'm I'm just wondering if you could share some insight into I don't know um yeah hidden disabilities and what we can all do to kind of facilitate those with absolutely so I went on a course recently to find out a little bit more about hidden disabilities and conditions and I was fascinated to find out that one in five people have a disability and 80 percent of those are hidden so uh, it's quite fascinating that you know you see the visible ones you know you can see that the physical disabilities but there are so many around 65 they think uh, hidden disabilities that you can't see you wouldn't know from looking at someone whether they've got a disability or disability or not so that um, lanyard that became quite popular during the pandemic was really helpful to highlight that the sunflower is a nice way of being able to say not just which I thought it was I have to confess I'm deaf I can't hear you I thought that's what it was for but actually it could be uh, just something that shows that I tire easily um, I've got something that means I can't work quite as hard for as long um, I need I need more frequent breaks I park in a disabled space because of something that's not visible. I have a hidden disability that uh, means that I, I need to be able to get into the shop more easily. So I think there are lots of things that we should be looking for in terms of hidden disabilities and supporting them in the workplace particularly and through, through our education as well. Fantastic. So I was going to say, so what, what can we all do to kind of be a bit more uh, hidden disability friendly? I, I mean, talk to people. So, mm. so the, the piece of advice, Ted Smith at the molecular, uh, sorry, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology here in Cambridge uh, has written a book called Hidden Disabilities, um, Creating a, a Good Place, a Workplace for Hidden Disabilities. Um, talk to people because you might think you know the best way that you can help someone with a particular disability, but everyone suffers a disability in a different way. Um, uh, and, and it's good to make sure that if you're working with someone, whether that's in uh, your education space or your workplace, that you understand the best things that you can do to help them uh, get the most out of, of whatever it is you're doing with them. Fantastic. And um, yeah, I know we've been working quite closely with uh, Emily May Armstrong, who's a big advocate, a big plant scientist, who's trying to help 
plant science laboratories become more disability friendly and, uh, and kind of explain that. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, have you got anything you'd like to ask Dan? Um, I think just to, just while Dan's here, um, and we've asked a few other people this on the live stream so far, but it'd be interesting to understand your journey from from studying, but from growing that sunflower <laughs> age age six to to where you are now, and mm. that would be that's just a really interesting thing for us to hear about. So I studied botany at university. I, I think I wanted to go and study biomedicine or bio, uh, uh, biochemistry. But I, I did a project whilst I carried out my A-levels uh, to look at tomatoes and I researched how to grow the perfect tomato because at the time the, first, the world's first genetically modified tomato had been created. I thought, wow, that sounds a really interesting thing. How, you know, what, are they, what are they doing there? Um, so I did a little project for my A-levels and that was my own little bit of uh, investigative kind of research looking at the literature. I became fascinated about the sorts of research that goes on um, in plant science. So I went and changed my career trajectory, uh, studied botany, I loved it, amazing, it's great, really good. Um, but I know that through doing so, not everyone has that shared passion and I, I really became puzzled as to why and how people don't necessarily see that interest that I could see myself. Um, so I went into to some research environments and I looked at plant science research um, but that nagging kind of, why does everybody think I do floristry? You know, what's this about? <laughs> um, why, why does that happen? So I studied a, a course in science communication to understand a bit about how people communicate and understand ideas. Uh, and then science, com uh, science education. Um, so I, I did a, a master's in science education and specifically looked at what happens in, in education. Why do primary school children find plant science so fantastic. You, know, you grow your seeds, you grow your crests in your year one class. Then you get to secondary school and you learn the dreaded photosynthesis equation. You know, what, what, what happens? Is it the student? Is it the content? What is it that causes that change in um, interest in plant science? Uh, so yeah, and then I, I managed to find the, the, the organisation for which I work now um, was looking for someone uh, to do some project management. So. Um, I applied for the job and I've been working trying to enthuse other people with plant science for 10 years now. Amazing. So I, I always ask this, but have you got a favourite plant and why? <laughs> I'm, yes, another plant from my childhood. I remember possibly where that early sort of spark, I, I grew runner beans with my dad in the garden. And I remember putting the runner bean in the ground, you turn around, you go back a week later, it's grown. I just remember thinking, how? You know, it looks dead. You put what looks like a stone in the ground uh, and it turns into a plant. I just wanted to know the answers. And I got through most of my undergraduate degree and I still didn't really know the answers. Uh, so yeah, I think there's so many questions and things out there to find out about plants. So they're, they're an amazing thing to, to study. Fantastic, thank you so much. So, we're going to move on to, which is a really weird idea about plants. So I think everyone here in, this, in, the, in the room with me are just massive plant nerds. But this is like a really weird question. And the, the name of this next video is, can fish grow on trees? Which is really weird. Like, what, what is this video going to be about? Someone has made some kind of super fish tree, <laughs> which sounds like it would smell hideous. Mm. Um, I definitely don't want to smell a fish tree. But I'm hoping that's what this video is going to be about. So let's find out. Here's a fish swimming in the sea. Oily fish are naturally rich in EVA and DHA, both of which belong to the group of fatty acids called omega-3. They offer many health benefits and help especially to keep our hearts healthy. Our body, however, can't really synthesize these. But it is recommended that we consume at least 450 mg of EPA and DHA per day from our diet. However, we have a problem. If everyone in the world followed these guidelines, it wouldn't work. The global fish stock can only support 16% of the demand for omega-3. Sadly, the population of fish in the ocean has dropped rapidly since the Industrial Revolution began anew to overfishing. So, fish
fish oil is good for us, but not so much for the fish. But what if I tell you that fish can grow on trees? Surely that can't be possible. Well, using genes, plant scientists at Rothamsted Research have figured out a way. Genes are a series of codes that are like instruction manuals for a cell to produce certain molecules. They are isolated genes that are responsible for the production of EPA and DHA. Those genes are then built into a little ring of DNA called a D-plasmid. They co-open this ring of DNA with a restriction enzyme, which is a molecule that acts like little DNA scissors that cuts at a specific place on the DNA sequence. They then put the T-plasmid with fish oil gene into a nifty little bacterium called the agrobacterium. The agrobacterium then goes on to infect a plant called Camelina sativa, commonly known as Camelina, a plant that produces oily seeds. The agrobacterium invade the plant cell and incorporates a part of its DNA into the plant genome and alongside with it the instructions to make the EPA and DHA. Now scientists have created a plant that produces oil rich in EPA and DHA, just like fish such as salmon and sardine. But like fish, plants can be grown easily on land, and they're a lot more efficient because they get their energy directly from the sun. Most importantly, no fish are harmed in harvesting, and we don't have to catch so many for our heart health. So good news for us, good news for the fish, and it doesn't stop here. Scientists are discovering more and more genes for the many molecules that are useful to us humans, from fish oils to rice rich in vitamin to new types of fuel to vaccines. So, yes, fish do grow on trees, and so can many more useful things. That was such a beautiful video. I've got to say, I found it really calming. I was just like, ah, oh. it's like a be like one of those podcasts you put on to kind of learn things as you're drifting off to sleep. Yeah. So the owner of that very calming, very serene voice happens to be here with us on the sofa. Hello. Hi, yeah. Thanks for having me. Cool. Thanks for coming in. Uh, so yeah, how? Um, that was a beautiful video. Uh, did you do those animations? I did. I drew them myself. That was just absolutely brilliant. And I've got to say, like, what an amazing piece of research that we now live in a world where we can, we can do that kind of thing. And my background is, is in the ocean. So, and this is, you know, we are, a lot of our stocks are overfished. And a lot of the, you know, we've, we've taken loads of fish to get the omega-3 oils. And now we're switching to krill to get the omega-3 oils. So to be able to actually grow those omega-3s straight uh, and get them straight from the plants is a phenomenal kind of piece of research. So I'm curious how, how you kind of came across that and like what sparked your interest in it? So I think initially I was interested in, it's almost like an idea of sort of absurdity, you know, when you have something that is something, but it's not something, it's something else instead. And then the people uh, from the Gatsby plant science program pointed me to this particular research and I thought wow this is actually really really interesting and so yeah that's why I decided to um, do on this particular topic and I think it's also fascinating because it sounds like something that is very sort of distant in the future like it sounds science fiction like but the truth is it's actually well it's already there the technology and yeah so that's yeah. how I came across to this. Yeah, I really, I really liked how you put it across with that kind of like, like you say, an absurd idea to, to start out with. And then um, I think that really, that it's a really sort of interesting hook to draw people in, to, to draw people into the story. Hook, I see what you did there with the fish. Oh yeah, that, uh, I was completely deliberate. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 I'm going to say, I did like the bit at the end where it said Finn. For the people who don't know that, French art house films, they end with Finn, which means end. Very clever. And what else was Finn's? Fish. That was that was subtlety. It was not lost on a culture just <laughs> such as myself. Anyway, I'll shut up. Um, yeah. So I'm curious now that you've encountered this new research, 
uh, are you like, ooh, what else could I do? I might, is this like an area of research or thinking that you'd like to go into in the future? Is this, or, or what other things you've encountered en route that, um, that you're like, oh, actually, there's this new piece of research where they're doing this. I don't know if you've, if, what you've, if you've thought about any of those things. Or? Ooh. Um, so I'm currently I'm studying uh, molecular and cellular biology. So um, I'll be very interested in knowing like what transgenesis can do. You know whether that's in this particular situation. You know we have like a new type of uh, food nutrients being made in plants. But, um, I think for me it's also just in general the sort of the universality behind the biological processes that fascinates me a lot and you know, and subsequently what is possible with it. So you talk about the universality, meaning that there's a lot of like similar, similar themes that run throughout different biological processes? Uh, in a way, I guess, um, I think fundamentally, because, you know, like DNA is the basic code for all forms of life in the world, and to me, that's like because we are not that different from other sort of existence that's alive, I guess. And I think that kind of goes back to the point where we're saying that all oh, this less interest in plant science, but in fact, it's all kind of very relevant. And then they are very complex as well, with like, you know, all sort of chemical processes going on in the background. And so they are interlinked. I think we all sort of interlinked. Definitely. Yeah, that's definitely something when we're trying to talk about plants, when we're trying thinking about trying to um, new ways of getting people excited about plants and thinking about teaching plants in, in and teaching plant biology in schools. And you kind of have to name it as plant biology to be its thing because it's the plant science bit. But also there are loads of things that happen in plants that are that happen in animals, that happen in bacteria, that happen in fungi. And there are all these different different processes, not you know, like you say, like with DNA, um, but also with um, with all sorts of um, other things. You know, we look at we often study osmosis in plants, for example, and we can look at that, and that's a imp really important biological uh, process that happens mm. across the whole of biology. So I think that for for me, you, can, you know, you can use plants to look at these to look at these ideas mm. and explore them a bit further. Um, that's one of the advantages of working with plants is you can poke them about a bit more than um, than one should if one is is working with other species. So. Definitely, and there's a really interesting video on our platform by uh, David Balkum, who talks through about uh, plants uh, and studying plants have led to broad understandings in biology as a whole that aren't just things to do with plants. So by studying plants, you actually find out more about all biology, not just plants, which I think is pretty cool. So yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, fantastic video. So uh, moving on to our next video then. I'm quite excited about this one. So this is, so we've done from, I guess, quite a, uh, you know, science, high science, I'd say that we were just doing there. This is now more, I, I think, kind of a more emotional side to what plants can do. And this is the, the link between plants and our mental well-being. So if we could uh, rack up this next video, that'd be great. In a world moving faster and further into the realm of technology and urbanization, we rarely get the chance to stop and smell the flowers. But if we did, we would feel the healing and calming properties of nature. Did you know that fragrance molecules from different plants can be detected by receptors in the nose and converted into electrical impulses that get sent to the brain at different frequencies? These frequencies are organized into separate classes named after the letters of the Greek alphabet and they control various cognitive functions such as alertness, calmness, and drowsiness. A concentrated source of plant fragrance is essential oils. These contain compounds known as terpenes, which affect the brain when inhaled. For example, the fragrance of mint increases the activity of the alpha class of brainwaves, boosting our alertness, while lavender, on the other hand, increases the activity of theta brainwaves, making you calmer and drowsier. Plant scientists found that when mothers and newborns took lavender baths, newborns cried less and their mothers smiled more. 
However, plants do not need to be highly concentrated into essential oils for us to experience their therapeutic effects. Hydrozole, such as rose water, or even fresh flowers, can positively affect our mental state. In one study, some plant scientists wanted to find out the effect that a species of rose known as the wishing rose had on the brain. The first thing they did was perform a POMS test, which is a questionnaire designed by psychologists to assess the mental state of a person. When subjects were in the presence of the wishing rose, the answers they gave showed that the rose had a sedative effect on the subjects. This was then followed up by another test that measured the parasympathetic nerve activity of the subjects, which is high when subjects are calm. So the scientists prepared four samples, whole wishing roses and wishing rose petals, which could both be smelt and seen, a blind, which is a rose but covered so that it can only be smelt and not seen, and finally they prepared a control, which could be smelt but not seen. In this case, plain water. For the blind sample, an increase in parasympathetic nerve activity was detected, indicating the rose's sedative effect as expected. However, for the whole flowers and the petals, the sedative effect strangely seemed to decrease. The scientists then recalled another pink flower known as the Petunia hybrida, whose color was found to uplift subjects and make them feel more energized. Based on this, the scientists concluded that it was the energizing pink color of the wishing rose that neutralized the calming effect of its fragrance. Isn't it interesting that according to the psychological POMS test, a rose's scent and appearance calms people down, but according to the physiological parasympathetic nerve activity, the rose's scent and appearance have two completely different yet both still equally positive effects? What more is there waiting to be discovered in the plant world of colors and smells? Clearly, plants have an impressive range of miraculous healing powers just waiting to be discovered. With mental health diseases on the rise as our modern world continues to transform at breakneck speed, we need to realize, appreciate, and explore the power of plants in therapy and in our daily well-being. I believe we need to take a step forward and go back to nature. That was awesome. Uh, I, I really love, I think all the fun science happens when you overlap really interesting areas. Mm -hmm. And taking this like area of psychology and uh, I guess kind of like botan, botan, botano chemi chemistry, is that a word? Sure, it is now. Yeah, I just now. made this up, there we go. I kept the chemicals of flowers and it's colour psychology and all this and bring, bringing it in together. Absolutely fantastic video. So we, we're joined on the sofa by uh, Rui and, uh, and Katie. So uh, Rui made the, uh, made the video. And so I'm interested as to like, how you first like, came across this, this piece of research and what like, inspired you to go on to make the video about it. Um, so I had a look at this article that was listing out the hundred different problems that plant science could potentially solve. And um, there was one about well-being, and that one caught my eye because I feel like it's something that we don't often associate with plant signs. Usually we go down the road of like um, tackling disease or feeding like a population that is growing. So I really wanted to try and explore a different aspect of plant science. And also I think it was pretty relevant because we had just come out of the pandemic and everyone probably would have experienced um, anxiety and like feelings like that, that plant sets could solve. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, fascinating. And so I guess, yeah, the, these chemicals, I mean, it was really interesting, like the difference between like, you know, something simple, like the difference between mint and lavender. So I, I guess, like, have you uh, encountered any other kind of like, whoa, this is kind of cool, or this, this chemical and this plant does this, uh, like on your, like, I guess when you were researching this video or just on your travels, if you encountered anything that's you've been like, whoa, that was pretty cool. Um, so like in terms of smells or, just, or, or smells <laughs> or just yeah, something so, like something that you that surprised you about how plants, uh, yeah, impacted the hum humans, you know, people's mental health or behavior or emotions or something. Um, I just found it interesting how so many aspects of the plant could affect a human differently. So like the visual aspect, the smells, um, 
and even sounds as well and I think something that I didn't go into in this video but the color green makes you calm apparently and that's why they have green rooms um, that people sit in before um, interviews like this <laughs> yeah to calm the people down before I've not made that I'd heard that about the color green before but I'd not made the association of that's why green rooms were traditionally painted green. That's really interesting. Because I know yeah, I like that. It's I've heard fact. of drunk tank pink, which is where if you're like an angry drunk person that gets arrested, the inside of the police cell is painted with this particular colour of pink that's supposed to calm you down, which I guess feeds maybe back into that flower psychology. Mm. There we go. Interesting. I think what was, I was just going to jump some of those chemicals that you mentioned that we were talking about the the terpenes in the the lavender and the mint and it's interesting those are so off, they're often like defensive for the plant they're defense chemicals so things to discourage animals from from eating them and yet they're things that we as humans yeah. we're like oh that's that's quite nice actually <laughs> um but it's brilliant yeah so i like i think so we've also got on the sofa we have got katie and Katie is a horticulturalist who uh, specialises in lots and lots of different types of plants. But I'm guessing it's quite interesting, this idea of trying to find new species to take you know, compounds of value and things like that. I don't know if you have any experience with this? To... Um, I think I'd probably say, so part of my role is working in the experimental section. Um, so that's working with researchers like yourself. Um, and part of that role is to um, basically help them with their experiments from start to finish, but then explain those experiments to the general public. So we have the circadian beds, how plants tell the time. We have the pigmentation beds. Um, so we're looking at um, how cotton um, can be dyed in a natural way. Um, and then we have, again, um, going back to sunflowers and dan, we have the branching um, beds as well to show how plant, uh, plants can be branched. Um, so, yeah, from that point of view, but not from a compound point of view, no, that's not, that's mm. far too specialist, I'm afraid. Because, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, I know, I know, I mean, you know, originally, I know back like when Linnaeus kind of came up with his way of, you know, like 200, 300, 400 years ago, we thought there was about 6,000 different plant species and now that number has increased exponentially and we're still finding new species all the time. And, and so this is one of the reasons. We, we often talk about like conserving plants and rainforest and things from a, oh, we need to make sure that we're maintaining biodiversity, uh, you know, and we're expected to kind of do that or, or recognize that that's the thing that we want to do altruistically. But actually, they, they, all these plants hold could hold you know very important compounds and stuff in them so i don't know if this is something that you're if you're like oh yeah i mean like for example there's the madagascar yeah, periwinkle that's the, that's the that's my that would be the go-to example i would go to yeah so you probably know more about this than i do oh, oh. Ooh, um, i've totally battered the, that no you're the, right. the yeah. short version of the the story is is that the from the madagascar periwinkle is a the drug was developed that it's that's a for treatment for cancer um so it's a very valuable Drug and now I think we have to be careful not to harvest too much Madagascan periwinkle um, because obviously it's a very val valuable substance. Um, but I think also I think just thinking about what you're talking about and you know these these scents and thinking around aromatherapy that I think sometimes science can be a bit dismissive of of these things and of different and treatments in different cultures and different uh, actually there's there you know when one they're, when they're explored then actually there are there are these um there are these effects mm. that are going on and just because they don't fit into our the model that we have at the moment mm. necessarily then doesn't mean that that they're not worth exploring and looking at exactly i guess this is so you know um through we, we've worked with rebecca lazaru who is a, a herbalist based at, at kew gardens and she looks going through historical texts and looking at compounds and things that have been traditionally used and then trying to, okay, like this, there's a record of this plant being used for this and so, so what is the active chemical in that that's causing this to happen and things. So yeah, it's a really exciting overlap between, I guess, psychology and botany and exploring like the world. She works with like some traditional healers and yeah. 
That's it's, a, yeah, it's really, really interesting. There we go. And having. how would a plant like, for example, you know, um, Arabidopsis, you know, one of the plants, you know, our main um, basal plant to study. And, you know, over the years, we now fully understand its, um, you know, its uh, genomic sequence. We fully understand the history of the plant from where we started to where we finished. So any change that we make. So how would that come into your work? I mean, mm -hmm. I know, for example, we're getting there with um, hibiscus um, and with tomatoes and sequencing them same, in the same way in the Koshiana. Um, so how does that affect the work you do in terms of having that level of understanding and then taking, yeah? Um, so you mean like having understanding for a specific plant or? Um, yeah, I guess just the basic, um, a basic understanding of, of, of plants, their, their sequences. Mm -hmm. And then how does your work fit within that or your science background? Um, I guess like the more that we know about plants and the more that we um, can learn about them the more we can use them to apply to different things so um, I think for this like this aspect the psychology and stuff we can look at um, the different plants and what they do every single plant has different qualities and I feel like there are so many plants that we haven't explored um, their properties of yet and just having um, a better understanding of those plants and perhaps different families of different plants could lead to us discovering like a wide range of different healing abilities that we can apply. Absolutely fantastic. Fascinating. So on that note, we're going to move on to our next video now. And I've got my idiot sheet here, which is quite useful. And this next video is, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the correct side. It's, there's a lot going on here. Uh, the next one is potentially a little bit contentious, but this is called all about tackling crop disease. There we go. Let's roll this one. Did you know that each year fungal diseases destroy at least 125 million tons of our top five crops? Rice, wheat, maize, potatoes and soybeans. This affects the yield profit and causes extensive damage to the environment. These diseases include wheat rust, potato blight and spot blotch. Wheat diseases cause yield losses of about 20% around the world and wheat and maize cost global agriculture $60 billion. The use of genetic modification is crucial. By 2050, agriculture will need to produce 50% more food due to the increase in world population, and so we need a sufficient amount of crop production. Therefore, we found a way to solve this problem, which is by gene editing. So gene editing is a type of technology where we can change the characteristics of a plant by adding, replacing, or removing base pairs, which are parts of the DNA sequence. Due to the limited amount of wheat being harvested through fungal diseases, we need to make the wheat more resistant. But the question is, how do we do that? Well, there are a few methods. One of them is using recombinant DNA. So we find a small sequence that contains the disease-resistant genes and insert it into the wheat's DNA. We can also use CRISPR-Cas9 editing. This is a type of technology which uses a protein called Cas9 to detect the position of the DNA to be modified. Then, we add the small sequence of the disease-resistant gene to it. If needed, some base pairs will also be deleted, but as a result, the seeds that contain the new genes are grown. These methods have seen amazing improvements in crop production. For example, in the 1940s, wheat was dwarfed to have heavier grains and be harvested easier. Since then, the production of wheat has increased significantly and saved people from poverty. In 2010, wheat's global production was 653 million metric tonnes. This shows these methods are safe to use and don't involve the use of pesticides or chemicals. And with genetic modification, the infection of rust decreased by up to 20%. Our take home message is that we want to raise awareness of these methods and the importance of genetic modification. These methods are still developing and improving and hopefully this video will encourage people to believe that these methods are a type of technology that has helped us environmentally and economically. Brilliant, thank you very much for watching that with us. 
Um, we're very lucky to be joined by um, someone who was involved in making that video. Um, so thank you very much. Welcome to the sofa, Theodora. Thank you. Um, just to start us off, um, uh, as we've asked lots of people, what, what made you want to focus on, on this particular issue for your video? So this, uh, the gene transfer, it was one of my modules in my first year. And I thought it would be cool to use it to um, tackle disease resistant crops because most of them are used to uh, for human like making insulin and um, the and right now like a lot of plant uh, a lot of diseases are tackled by antibiotics or antimicrobes bill and it would be um, better to use gene transfer because actually microbial resistance is re really dangerous for the environment now. Yeah, yeah, you're ab yeah, absolutely right there that if you're using these broad pesticides or antimicrobial mm. things that, um, that you, you get to, yeah, resistance developing um, in, the, in the population. Um, and were there any, the, do you use the, the example there of a... Um, was it a rust disease in that yeah. in that one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because it has this massive, massive impact. Um, rust diseases. Um, were there any other particular examples that you that you thought might be worth that you thought were particularly significant that you can re um, remember? <laughs> I guess papaya was one of the crops that. Um, so it was used to. The, the, the disease was used to uh, be tackled by also pesticides, but then the virus, it was papaya spot ring virus, and the virus developed a resistance to the pesticide. So using resistant gene would um, tackle the papaya ring spot virus. Wow. Yeah, nice. I think it's often we when we talk about plant disease, we get quite focused on on wheat and the kind of I mean cereal crops are really are really important right but I think there are these other these other crops that are um, you know really important in in our lives that bring us all sorts of um, you know not only sustenance and vitamins and minerals but enjoyable enjoyable things and certainly um, and some of those are quite under threat bananas quite under threat as well I know well I think well the coffee thing is a big issue I think at the moment and with this coffee rust fungus that you were talking about in the video because not many people know that coffee is the second most traded commodity on earth after oil and all of the coffee plants in South America all of them are descended from a single plant right and so and because climate change is increasing the conditions that coffee rust fungus likes and so this coffee rust fungus is just going crazy across the whole of South America and the reason that we don't have any coffee grown in Sri Lanka anymore is because that entire crop was wiped out by coffee rust fungus when coffee was mm. first introduced. So our coffee is very very sensitive and very fragile so basically trying to breed in this extra or, or develop this extra disease mm, resistance mm. is really 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 crucial. So I guess I, I'm interested because a lot of people when they see like, ooh, genetic engineering, it's, not, it's really bad, isn't it? And so I think well, I'm interested to, to be, because quite clearly there's a big benefit of this. So I'm, I'm curious as to, like, I mean, this clearly, this gene editing side of things is really beneficial in terms of feeding the world. So I'm curious as to what you would say to people who might be maybe a bit like, oh, GM, like, I don't know. Yeah, actually, um, naturally, we've been doing that by crossbreeding plants, uh, crops to make it more resistant or more uh, have more yield. But we, um, with this modern technology, we can cut through time because crossbreeding takes generations and a lot of years. And with um, gene transfer, it will be easier and faster. Yeah, so it's just speeding up a, 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 yeah. a process that we were doing anyway. But yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a, an argument that it, of it being more specific as well when you're 
you know, I think you meant you covered that a little bit and mentioned that in the video that you know it's when you're breeding, you just you're selecting you're selecting the traits that you yeah. want, but you don't know what else is going on. But the the um, these the selective work with particular genes can be can be quite precise. Definitely. I mean, we used to use these things called gamma gardens in the 1950s, where we would just blast plants with a radioactive source and just cause all these random mutations in them and just hope for the best. And so all of the mints that we now get in supermarkets is a descendant where they just blasted it with radiation and it caused a mutation that made it uh, resistant to a t type of fungus, um, that, which meant that we now can get mint in our supermarkets and have mint tea and all the rest of it, whereas previously, with the mint before the 1950s, we wouldn't have been able to. Nice. Facts. Nice. Here they go. <laughs> there we go. Before we um, move on to our next video, I was just going to ask um, Theodore the question we've been asking everyone. Just kind of what your what your route to here today? How did you get here today? Route. Uh, oh yeah, route again, deliberate. Um, but you know what? What's your what are you studying at the moment? And um, you know where? Hopefully, you're interested in plants. But <laughs> yeah, I study biotechnology. But this year, this semester, I have uh, I chose an optional module of applied plant physiology. It's basically studying on how plants respond to environments such as like uh, light intensity or like water or like nutrients in the soil. So yeah. Oh, cool. And, and uh, oh, just where where are you studying at the moment? Oh, uh, I study at University of Nottingham. Nice, nice. Do you get to do, do you have, you've been into some of the sort of like growth chamber places? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I went to a greenhouse and they were growing wheat that could have proteins in it. It was so cool. Yeah. yeah That's nice. really awesome. That's really awesome. Thank you ever so much. That was a really cool video. So continue to explore the world or the potential of, of gene technology and gene editing. We've now got, uh, which looks to be quite a fun video, by a team of, of, uh, of our undergrads who put together a bit of a newsreel, it would seem. So let's, uh, let's roll that and see what happens. Hello, and welcome to Hot Gossip. We're your hosts, Rainbow Dream, and me, Sunshine Buttercup. And in today's show, we will be taking a slightly different approach. Yes, indeed. Today, we're diving into the world of science. As temperatures are rising due to climate change, crop yield failures is becoming a big issue. Indeed. Current predictions are showing the probability of crop yield failure to be as much as 25 times higher by 2050. And as a result, it is now said that 828 million people go to bed hungry every night. But scientists think they have a solution to our problem. Of course they do. A relatively old method of breeding crops has had a new update, which scientists believe could prevent any future crop yield failure. You guessed it. Today we will be talking about the controversial top topic of GM. And last week, we spoke to two scientists who believe in its magic. Hello and welcome back to Hot Gossip. And today we are also joined by Dr. Helena and Dr. Tabitha, who are going to tell us all about GM. Hi. Hi, thank you for having us in to talk to you today. No worries. Yes. It's such an important issue that we want to get people talking about, so this is great. So ladies, my first question for you is, what is GM? Well, GM just stands for genetic modification, which involves improving the characteristics of plants so they can be better used by people. Okay. But what does GM do for us and why are you so convinced that we need it? Well, we're really excited about the possibility of using genetic modification to create climate resistant crops that will be resilient to all kinds of changing weather like droughts and flooding. This means we'll be able to grow them in places that they wouldn't have even been able to survive before. So, like, obviously this is all good news and stuff, but what other incentives are there to grow GM? Apart from feeding the future population. Yeah. Well, I can answer this one. 
So not only is GM key to feeding a future population, but it's also a way to deliver key vitamins to people. Right. But why would we care about that? Yeah. Well, as we've seen with golden rice, which is infused with vitamin A, vitamin A helps to support a healthy immune system, which can reduce your risk of acne and keep you hydrated, giving your skin a healthy glow, as well as a whole host of other benefits. So what you're saying is, that I can get nice skin by eating GM crops. Yeah. Nice. We also haven't even got on to discussing how buying GM crops can help you save money. Okay, do tell. Well, many GM crops are able to grow using less water and pesticides, and this means that farmers will be able to grow crops more cheaply and therefore food prices will be lower. I see no flaw to this plan. One thing we might be forgetting, freaky side effects. I don't want to grow an extra limb just because I decided to trust new science. Yeah, and I have heard that GM contains a high level of toxins. And can alter our DNA. Mm. Well, all of this misinformation is actually one of the main reasons we want to get people talking about GM crops again. We've been genetically engineering crops for hundreds of years through selective breeding. Like farmers have chosen the best and biggest and tastiest carrots or potatoes and so on and have bred them together so that they can keep growing great crops for us. Although this particular way of genetic engineering crops is fairly new, there have been over 100 research studies comparing the effects of traditional food to GM crops since its commercialisation and there have been no evidence of any ill effects from eating approved GM crops. So, no toxins? No. And no changes to my DNA? No. It's just making crops more resilient and more nutritious. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Indeed, there may be a light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't know about you, but I'm on board with the GM crew. So what are we waiting for? Uh, well, actually, we do need to try and convince governments to lift the restrictions that are on GM crops so that we can... <laughs> Jeez, guys, one problem at a time, please. Oh, okay, these scientists getting ahead of themselves. Why then? So rude. How much time okay. do they think we have? Speaking of which, I'm afraid that it's time for us to go. I know, I know. Sad times indeed. But we will see you next week. With a special on Kylie Jenner and what beauty hacks she's kept hidden from you. Once again, we are your hosts, Rainbow Dream. And me, Sunshine Buttercup. Bye, Bye for now. now. Looks like we've got some competition for our uh, live broadcasts uh, from that team. Um, it was a really fun way of looking at uh, GM crops and thinking about how we, how we talk about them and how we might... Um, how different things different people might care about when we're thinking about, about GM crops. Mm. Uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by, I think, two members of that team. So we've got Hannah on the sofa, and I think we've got Tabitha um, online uh, as well. So there she is. Oh, fantastic. Tabitha and Kat. Don't look at it, it's not a plan. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, so thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I was just going to ask, um, we'll start with Hannah and then we'll, we'll go to Tabitha afterwards just so you don't end up talking over each other. Um, just why did you choose that particular, that particular approach of doing something a bit like a sort of sketch, I suppose? Um, I think it was Bethany's idea because we just wanted to bring the approach to people to not be afraid of GM crops because we've been eating GM crops for so long, but people are generally they don't really know what it is so it terrifies them and we just wanted to um build um build their information and let them know you know it's normal we have gm crops you know don't be terrified <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and is there anything in that um thinking uh and he looked at the screen then uh but i look at the camera to speak to you Tabitha. um as you were you were putting that together. Did you need to, were there sort of different ways you were thinking about communicating around GM crops, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say there. 
yeah, I think yeah, it's I think quite, it's important, quite important, important to understand to about, about the different ways that you can explain things to people who might not necessarily know about DNA. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you, you know, thinking about um, explaining things to different audiences, people with different backgrounds. Um, we've got a lot of, of people who know a lot about science and in, in the room here today. But actually, you know, lots of people um, don't have that don't have that same that have that same background. So I think yeah, you guys did a really good job of that. It was really it was really good fun. I really enjoyed the, the, your use of humour in it. It was really um, it's really engaging. Um, we're joined also back on sofa. Um, she was here this morning. We've got Pallavi on the sofa as well. Um, so Pallavi's work involves looking at how we can think about uh, developing crops and using different approaches to uh, develop yeah, crops that are more efficient um, and produce more more food for us. And I think GM is quite a, a key part of that. Is that part of the work that you're you're hoping to do in your your new lab that you've just set up yeah absolutely um so uh, my research revolves around like improving uh, crop production and more looking at the side of photosynthesis and how plants can make their food better and use water nitrogen more efficiently to have higher yields that that is more grains and i think uh, the gm approach or genetically uh, modified approaches are very crucial to answering these questions uh, so we are looking at like very molecular levels of things and uh, then going to a very um, so I would probably say that we are just uh, like engineers working with plants and uh, looking precisely at different genes or uh, the codes of uh, DNA and uh, just changing it very precisely and uh, working towards like making plants more resilient to say pathogens, for instance, or making them, uh, you know, grow better, make better use of the resources and nutrition that they have. And um, just uh, following up on that, we're also looking at the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which is not just genetically modifying the whole thing, but being very precise and genetically editing the exact gene or the sequence that we want in the plant. So there's lots of lots of new development going on with this transgenic technologies, which I think is for good, for sure. So I feel like my role in the room is I'm going to be devil's advocate, okay? And I'm going to try and pose some questions which are a bit like, not not anti-GM necessarily, but on the fence about GM. And please feel free to answer answer these questions. So I feel that the, the drive toward increasing these better crops to feed the world, climate resistance, disease resist, resistance, etc., is very well founded. And I feel like it comes from a very good place. I guess one of, you know, we talk about high levels of scientific literacy and people understanding the scientific process behind this. Do you think, I think one thing that people are maybe a little bit worried about from scientists is this maybe level of arrogance that we've thought through everything. And there's definitely times in the past where we've trusted scientists and been like, and they're like, trust me, it's the best thing to do. And then it's like, oh, actually, we didn't think of that or we didn't fully understand that process. The one that top, off the top of my head is like the introduction of cane toads into Australia, where the cane toads are introduced to eat the cane beetles so we can grow more sugar cane. And then once they were there, the cane toads were like, oh, there's loads of other stuff to eat. I'm not going to eat that. And now the cane toads, you can't stop them and they're ravishing. Uh, they're just moving across the whole of Australia. So obviously at the time when they were introduced, everyone listened to the scientists and the scientists had the best intentions. So I'm just curious to try to draw a particular parallel between that. Do you, like, I guess one of the worries is, okay, we've made this Franken plant this, that wouldn't occur naturally. What do we think, are, are there any dangers of releasing this into a, a wild place? I don't know. This is, I'm just being devil's advocate here, so. So I think, I mean, the plants have been growing in the fields for a long time. And if you think about uh, uh, the gene pool being mixing, that's been happening for like years and years. So for example, the maize that we eat at the moment was never the maize uh, that was present in the wild cultivar. So the teosintine, which is uh, the wild cultivar of maize was very, very different. And you won't even recognize it as a maize plant versus what we have now. So um, I think uh, that is something not really to worry, but I wouldn't say that take the words of the 
scientists as a gospel. We are doing a lot of field testing. So we have uh, special um, like areas where we are testing these plants to see that there's no detrimental effects to the wild ecosystem, for instance. And that's not just happening in one location. We're trying to you know, geographically spread um, it at different places and see how that is affecting, say, pollination, for instance, or like um, any sort of horizontal gene transfer that might happen with the other gene pools or like the wild um, ecosystem, for mm -hmm. instance. So when you say horizontal gene transfer, that's genes, that's interbreeding with wild plants yeah. in that area. Absolutely. But that happens like on a normal basis, even in a wild ecosystem, if you would say. It's not something that would be accelerated because it's a GM plant or not. And I think now with like these um, precise technologies like CRISPR-Cas9, we, we know exactly what we are tailoring or what we are addressing. So, you know, this whole... Um, like uh, skepticism about whether that would uh, be more readily transferred to the wild system becomes quite less because we know that we've precisely edited one thing and there's no uh, backlog of it to actually be transferred into the ecosystem for instance yeah and i think i think it's it's worth thinking you know thinking about these things as a whole that when we are when we are starting to use these technologies that just because we've got a plant, for example, that is resistant to a herbicide, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a good idea to spread herbicides everywhere and keep and use those mm. loads and loads of nitrogen, something that, that can happen and has happened in the past. So it's, it's, it's you're thinking in a more sort of holistic ecosystem approach, perhaps, mm. is, um, is part of that. And certainly the work that goes on in just um, if people wonder, because obviously there's work that goes on in labs as well. We're doing these, there, there are field trials that happen, but um, the work that goes on in labs is very tightly controlled and things are not allowed. There's no risk of anything that people are working on that hasn't then been, been tested of getting out into um, into mm. the environment. And um, that's all very well looked after. No, definitely. And I think I think one of the other aspects yeah, to look at is one of the big, big causes of or loss of di diversity is cutting down forests to, for arable land. So if we can get more per area out of our arable land by using GM crops, it makes it more efficient, which fundamentally will, will reduce biodiversity loss through to, from intensive agriculture further down the line. So, yeah. so there we go. So um, ooh, we're going to bring people back onto the sofa. We're going to try and get everyone on the sofa. No, there we go. <laughs> uh, Katie, you want to come join us on the sofa? And um, Oh, uh, and, and Dan, do you want to come back on the sofa? Thank you. And we're going to see if we've got uh, any questions hanging out uh, online anywhere. Uh, if you've got any questions, what well, I forgot to say throughout the thing, please put them on. Don't forget to send us your questions. If you've got any questions, while well, we're waiting for people to text in some questions, has anyone in the audience got any questions for our wonderful panelists or for each other? No one's got any questions. Brilliant. Oh, we've got a question. Yeah, so like uh, with GM, we are increasing the production and everything. So what we are doing, like, because we are getting all the nutrients from the soil. So how we are replenishing them, like the soil? And the second, when we are getting produced, how we are trying to, because now, like in developing countries, the post-harvest production, like the harvesting equipment or the facility is not that good. So even we have like a good production, we lose the fruit, crops and everything. So what we are doing like, to facilitate that according to our like, GM planning and everything. So just for people who might not have been able to hear that because they weren't near the microphones, the first question there was about what are we doing to replenish the nutrients in soil um, when we've got these GM crops uh, which we're growing. So does anyone like to... I think it depends where we're growing the plant. If we're growing them in a glass house, um, then we will use um, the soil will be re-sterilized um, with hot air that literally 
Um, so let's say we have a wheat crop um, and it's grown directly in the soil and it has a, a glass house environment over it. And then you'll literally put like a almost like a mini polytunnel directly over the soil and then you'll um, supply hot air into that environment and then that will kill off any pathogens or anything remaining in that soil and then it can re be reused. Somewhere like an outside environment and this doesn't just reply to genetically modified crops, this is just crops in general. Mm -hmm. So like allotments, so you know when you're growing at home you'll have your plots on on, um, rotation that is you know so that you don't have the same um, diseases that go specific with that plant and that you're giving the new crop a chance to, to thrive um, yeah so so just because something is a GM crop doesn't mean you should treat it differently so there's still this idea of a sustainable agricultural practices and moving away from monocultures and doing things like crop rotation to allow the soil to rejuvenate over time okay exactly yeah Okay, awesome. And the second question, I got distracted by the first one. The second, <laughs> the second question was around infrastructure uh, post around harvest. agriculture. Post yeah. yeah. Yes. So, like, I think that's an important question about thinking that not just getting the fruits or like the cr uh, seeds from the crops. It's more about how that reaches the market and how well it is stored for the timing. And I think there's like some um, work that's going on in like some of these um, um, institutions, for instance, like at IRI in the Philippines that works on like rice, for instance, and at CIMIT, uh, which works on wheat, uh, thinking about what is the best way to harvest these seeds and how um, they can be stored well. And also like educating the farmers about the best, uh, you know, housekeeping of these uh, seeds, for instance, and how it could be stored for longer duration and there's been I think lots of um, like um, involvement of even the general um, public to be aware about like the issues associated with post-harvest um, uh, best practices and best keeping of these grains and fruits for instance and one of the examples for that was uh, the tomato the flower sour tomato which is uh, a GM tomato that actually increases the shelf life of tomato so uh, probably a normal tomato would um, die off in a week or so but then with this flower sava gene they could um, increase the shelf life of tomato for longer so you know genetic modified crop actually comes into this post harvest side of things and uh, making it mm. um, live longer on the shelf so reducing yeah. food waste at the same time which is you know i think was a third of the food that we make ends up going to waste or something like that absolutely and i think one thing that i've noticed as a supermarket where we buy our food at home um it says no best before date on the fruit and veg that we buy now um on the packaging that you get because there's no need you can see whether a yeah. carrot is any good or not you know if it's gone all bendy and floppy then <laughs> You know, could probably still cook it, but it's, you know, so, so you don't want to use it with the hummus, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that post post um, production loss is really important. I think that's you know, that's why I find plant science so interesting because there's so many different aspects that you can research and look at and think about. It's not just about the growing of the plant; it's the fifty percent of the action that's going on underground and the, the release of some of the photosynthate into the ground that maintains that that collection of organisms underground mm. that helps the plant gather more resources. Um, it's about thinking about how you get um, less disease. It's about how you maintain the crop for longer, how you uh, maximize yield. There's so many different elements I think mm. are so important to that us being able to produce our food more sustainability. And I, more I, sustainable. I think that remember, you know, we, we talk about buying things in, in the supermarket and that post harvest, that's still a living, the fruit, you know, the fruit and vegetables that we buy, are still, they're still living until they start, until the cells start to die and they start, they start to rot. And I think that in itself is an amazing, is an amazing, yeah. is an amazing thing to think about. And you talk about not having best before dates and we're obviously we're trying to move to using less plastics. But then there are some things that if you don't travel, if they don't travel in plastic, then they get too damaged to eat. So I think cucumbers are one of those that might put cucumbers are one of those things that actually we don't like to see things wrapped in plastic but actually if you don't wrap cucumbers up in plastic then they they get too damaged during transport mm. and then they don't get eaten at all so it's it's a, it's a you know these things they're complicated mm. complicated issues and i think um, that also goes hand in hand with technology so for example you know apples will spend months and months in controlled environments um you know in very cold temperatures you know to keep them going for the seat for the for the year um and yeah packaging like you said is very important as well um 
Yeah, I, I do find um, the topic of ge um, genetically modified um, plants and also organic um, plants and also packaging all quite interesting because um, we talk about, say, you know, you could have your raspberries at this time of year, but they're being flown all the way from South Africa. So obviously the carbon footprint there is huge, but they'll say organic on them, etc. And you're just like, well, hang on a second, you know, which offsets which? So I think it is part of a larger picture. Mm. I think it's important not to just focus on genetically modified plants or packaging packaging or controlled mm. environments i think you've got to see it as a holistic i think you were saying a holistic approach to how how we view these things yeah in terms, i mean again we talk broadly about the environmental impact of different foods but you really need to be like super specific about what that environmental impact of different foods are so for example if you look at greenhouse gas emissions coffee isn't far off beef once you take into it per, per kilogram, when you take into account all how it's manufactured and land use change and all the rest of it. And nuts are actually carbon negative because they grow on trees and they take stuff, they take carbon out of the atmosphere. But then when you look at it in terms of water use, then nuts are some of the worst, like because they gr are grown in areas where uh, water scarcity is very high, like a, a lot of almonds are grown in California. So there's that aspect. And then when you look at biodiversity loss, you know, um, things like palm oil have got a lot, a lot of bad rap because they're associated with like the destruction of rainforests and orangutans. But actually, um, coconut oil is far worse in terms of biodiversity loss because most coconuts, coconut palms grow on these isolated uh, de like island chains where they've got you know, a lot of endemic species, which are much more at risk. So it's really interesting. So it's like, you've got to kind of, you're like, what? This is an absolute minefield. You've got to kind of pick your battle. What, am I going for plastic? Am I going for carbon? Am I going for, for water? Am I, you know, am I going for biodiversity? So it's, and I guess to a degree, like, I mean, as well as like GM helping us get more out of a square it also <laughs> or a specific area it also comes down to i guess to kind of eating more locally and seasonally like broadly is is that a, a thing that we like yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone's like what yeah, are you talking yeah. about there we go no. no absolutely and i think that as you know dan said so you know thinking about studying plants and looking at plants and understanding more about them and certainly you know one of the reasons i like doing my job is because you know, always picking up, learning, learning new things about how um, how plants have different strategies to survive, even though they they look like they're not doing much. They look like they can't move. They look like they can't communicate. And actually, they are um, they are moving. They are communicating. They are there's all sorts going on inside their cells that we're just not able to see just without um, you know without without digging a little bit deeper. So I think. And there are all these different things that they impact on. And we talked earlier about how they, how the process, there are processes in plants that are, you know, the same as processes that happen for humans or for bacteria or for, and they have all this, this amazing impact. So I think they're really, um, I mean, certainly why I like, why I like, you know, communicating about plants and, and talking about them because they've got so much so much, so, so much to give. So much, so much to give. Absolutely, to give. absolutely. So much to give to the world. So, and on that note, well, we hope that you have enjoyed learning about plants and speaking to all our speakers, watching all these amazing videos. Um, as much as we have, I've learned loads. Uh, it's been a fantastic time. If you have got any comments, unfortunately, uh, you can't ask them live, but you can ask them in the space below, and our team will do our best to respond to those questions. But uh, you've been a fantastic audience. You guys have been fantastic as well. Okay, let's just make loads of noise because this is the end of the live stream and we can, uh, we can go and chill out after this. So, yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. There we go. Um, but thank you to everyone. You've all been wonderful human beings. You're a wonderful human being. You're a wonderful human oh, being. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you guys have been great. And thank you for watching Rootstock. See you next year.